why is it important for us to have a philosophy to follow for life? Oh, we all have a philosophy of life, whether we realize it or not. Uh, it's so, so, given that, it might be a good idea to actually think about it from time to time and see whether the philosophy of life that we follow uh, more or less automatically is a good one. For instance, I tend to consider religions as a type of philosophy of life. And most people fall into one religion or another just because they're born into a particular society and they're born in a particular family, etc. So if you're a Christian or a Jew or a Muslim or a Buddhist or an Hinduist, you already have a philosophy of life. It's kind of ready-made for you. Even if you grow up in a non-religious family or culture, if you're a psycho humanist, that's also a philosophy of life. And so, it, you know, pretty much everybody has it. So the question is, from time to time, is it a good idea to stop and think about it and see, well, does this philosophy that I kind of fell into actually fit me? Does it does it make any sense? Do, are perhaps there some alternatives that make more sense? So from time to time, it might be a good idea to just stop and and reevaluate things. Even people who are non-religious who say, no, I don't actually have a philosophy of life, they do have one by default, which is visible by the way they act, right? We all have certain priorities in life. We act in certain ways and not in other ways. Well, those are those those things, those behaviors can be put together by an external observer and say, oh, that person's philosophy of life, therefore, is informed by this or that criterion and this or that precept and so on and so forth. So, so the, the basic question, I think, is not so much why is it important to have a philosophy of life, because we all have it. The question is, should we from time to time stop and think about it and perhaps change it or alter it or, you know, or even occasionally reject the, the basic one that we, are, we, we grew up with and perhaps look for something else? Yeah, I'm guessing this is something you did for yourself. I remember doing this when I was in depression, trying to rebuild my life. I was forced into a corner and <laughs> had to like really come up with a system for life. But for most people, I think unless you're pushed to do it, they, they don't actually do it. And I think, to, in my opinion, that's one of the reasons why we have as much chaos as we do now, because... People are making shit up as they go along and <laughs> they often end up doing things that are convenient, but cost them in the long run. At least it seems like that to me. So I would love to get your thoughts around this for people who, you know, like you said, who people who would say that I don't have a life philosophy, but I have these ideas. How do they organize that into a coherent philosophy so that they're actually living life that meets a higher standard than the one they are they perhaps set themselves for themselves based on convenience. Yeah, you're right. A lot of people do go through life like that. Uh, the pre-Socratic philosopher Heraclitus, who lived in Ephesus, which is in modern Western Turkey, uh, actually said that uh, most of his compatriots were sleepwalking through life because they were not thinking about what they were doing. They were just, as you say, they were just making it up as it, as it goes. Uh, it doesn't seem like it to be a, a good idea. I mean, we tend to think ahead about pretty much everything, right? We, we plan financially, for instance, for our, you know, if you want to buy a house or go, or retire or go on a vacation, we, we, you, you plan financially. Most people go to college or, or do something else in order to prepare themselves for a particular career. Uh, we prepare, you know, we we prepare for things like for major events in life, like you know, marriage or uh, having or not having children. So, so all of those things show that we are in fact capable of thinking ahead, and that we do think that that's a good idea. So, why not for the broader umbrella of a philosophy of life? Now, as far as how to do it. Well, read a book, for instance, right, right. <laughs> or or listen to a podcast like this, or you know, there's these days there's really a lot of resources, and so it kind of it's a little lazy of somebody to say, oh, I don't have the time, I don't have the resources, I don't know what to do. It's like, come on, you, you can you can spend hours on social media doing nothing. You can certainly pick up a book or or a podcast and start learning about philosophy of life. But you're right that a lot of people don't get to that point unless they're prompted by a major event. Yeah. Now in your case that was you know that was a serious situation. In my case it wasn't that serious. I, I just reached 
you know, midlife crisis kind of thing, which most people do at some point or another. And a midlife crisis doesn't have to be any major event. It's just at some point it dawns on you that you've been living on Earth for several decades. Then you may or may not have a few more decades to go. And you ask yourself, well, you know, what do I want to do with the rest of that of that time? Um, that is a fairly straightforward set of questions, but it can lead you to completely re rethink and, and, and sort of reformulate the way you live your life, meaning, meaning your priorities, your goals, your values, and so on and so forth. So that can be a, that, that's a fairly common trigger. Lots of people get to that point, even without major, uh, you know, events in their lives. Of course, if you do have a major event, the, the loss of a loved one, for instance, or even just the loss of your job, and all of a sudden your career is in shambles or something like that, that might also prompt you to say, ah, wait a minute, am I, am I doing things the way I really want them to do it to do or or should I be, maybe look for something else yeah that makes sense now coming particularly to stoicism let's talk about stoicism the fundamentals of stoicism because I think a lot of people misunderstand what it's about yeah there's a lot of misunderstanding because the word stoicism in modern English is often understood as you know live your life with a stiff upper lip and and suppressing emotions which is really not what stoicism is about it's a it's a distorting stereotype now as a lot of stereotypes there is a grain of truth there i mean stoicism does have does put an emphasis on resilience for instance and therefore you you can get the stiff upper lip uh, from there it does put the emphasis on talking to your emotions not suppressing your emotions but talking and modulating your emotions so so there are reasons why the stereotype is there but let's go back to the basics so one way to understand stoicism i i think is to go back to what the ancient stoics themselves said all of the early stoics said that their philosophy of life essentially amounted to, as they put it, living in agreement with nature or in accordance with nature. Now, what does that mean? Uh, it, it, they didn't mean that you should strip naked and go into the woods and hug trees. That's not what living according to nature is. Yeah. Nor did they mean that whatever is natural is good, because there's obviously lots of things that are natural, poisonous mushrooms, cancer, things like that, that are obviously not good for you. So, so then what did they mean? Perhaps one way to explain it is by way of an analogy. Suppose that you invite me over for dinner and I bring the, you know, the customary bottle of wine or something like that. But I also bring you a present. I bring you a cactus, right? So now you're responsible for that cactus, for that plant. And in order for you to take care of that plant, you, you have to know something about the nature of cactuses, right? You know it's a plant, so it needs water and light, among other things. But you also know that it's a desert plant. And desert plants need little water and a lot of light. If you give them a lot of water and less light, they're not going to do well. So in other words, you need to know something about the nature of cactuses in order to take care of that plant. Well, the Stoics thought that the same goes for us as human beings. We are living organisms, and we have certain things that we need and other things that we need to stay away from. And the point is to figure out what kinds of things make a human being flourish. Now, according to the Stoics, there's two categories of things that are good for human beings. One, we share with other animals. We need food, we need water, we need shelter, uh, we need to stay away from pain uh, and stuff like that. Fine. That, those are things that we share with most other animals. Most other animals need the same things. And then there's a second group of things, there's a second category, which are actually specific to human beings. And according to the Stoics, those are, we are capable of reasoning, so we, we actually think our way through problems, right? We don't have, unlike other animals, we don't have wings, we don't swim fast, we don't have fangs, we don't have nothing like that. Big muscles, you know, things like, but we have a brain, and we use that in order to solve problems. The second thing that is quintessentially human is that we are highly social. There are other social organisms, of course, you know, from social insects like ants and termites 
to other species of mammals, including a lot of species of primates. But human societies are really complex. They're the most complex societies you can think of on, on planet Earth. So from these two things, the Stoics derived the idea that to flourish, to do well in life, we need to reason correctly and act pro-socially. Right? So to live according to nature for a human being, and therefore for a Stoic, means think right and act right, meaning act uh, pro-socially, cooperatively with other human beings. So really Stoicism boils down to a philosophy that teaches you how to think and how to act in society. That's pretty much the basics. Now, there is a lot more you know, that, that goes into to fill the details, but that is the basic idea. Two things are really characteristic of the Stoic life thinking as well as possible and being pro-social, acting pro-socially. Okay, but now here I would beg for some clarity because in today's world, pro-socially would, to I think a lot of listeners, it would probably mean agreeing with the majority. Some people might consider that to be one of the meanings that you're implying here, but considering with the way the world is functioning right now, that could actually be very, very dangerous. Yeah, that's yeah. definitely not what the Stoics meant. Um, they, they, they did not mean, oh, well, just go along with the thing. There were some ancient philosophers who did suggest that. The Pyrrhonists, who were a group of skeptics, basically said, you know, the good life is just go with the flow of whatever it is that, in, that people think in society. So act in, a, in agreement with social customs. Not the Stoics. The Stoics thought that you have to use your reason. And so... To act pro-socially means to use your reason in order to improve your own life and other people's lives. And sometimes that does mean, you know, coming up with behaviors or with interactions with other people that may not be particularly welcome. The notion is you always try to do what is best for you and for other people, whether they agree or not, uh, whether that whether society at large thinks it's a good idea or not. For instance. Uh, let me give you one example from the ancient Stoics. The ancient Stoics were among uh, a, the few philosophers who thought that women really should be taught philosophy because women are just as rational uh, organisms as, in, as, as men, and therefore they ought to be taught. It's good for them to be taught philosophy and to participate in the philosophical life. Well, that was a, definitely not the general opinion in society. If we're talking about ancient Greece and Rome, women were definitely not uh, considered, you know, at the same at the same level of as men. In fact, especially in Greece, women were not educated; they were excluded from any kind of position of power, and so on and so forth. Less so in Rome, but even in Rome, the, there was certainly no equality. And yet, the Stoics thought, no, this. These people, are the, you know, this category, this group of human beings is just as rational or capable of rationality as anybody else, and so we ought to do this. So that's what I mean. So there are clear examples in Stoic history where the Stoics were doing something that they thought was rational, but didn't necessarily agree with society at large. Here is another example. The Stoics were very clearly uh, uh, had a problem with t with tyranny, with political. Uh, tyranny. So several Stoics opposed uh, some, both in words and sometimes actually picking up arms, you know, fighting against uh, uh, tyrants. So there are examples of Stoics who picked up arms against Julius Caesar, who they saw as a tyrant, and against some of the Roman emperors, Nero, Vespasian, and Domitian in particular. Now, those were unpopular positions. You know, you could lose, literally lose your head if you do that, that sort of stuff. Uh, it would have been much easier to just go along with the general way of looking at things. But the Stoics thought, no, these are tyrants. They are actually, you know, not improving human society. They are, they are not allowing people to flourish. So this is something that we need to oppose. So Stoics are not, they don't have a problem in going against the social more if it is justified. Sometimes it's not, right? Sometimes society works okay and, and there is no particular reason to, to go against uh, the grain. But, in, but it depends. You have to use your, your brain and say, okay, this is a one case in which I need to go against the current and this is another a case in which I can go along with it. Okay, so it's safe to say that 
for Stoics, what this idea meant was to do what supports society's growth in the right direction. Yeah, sort of. They were not concerned with society at large because society is kind of an abstraction. It's like, uh, all right, well, what do you mean by society? Society is made of individuals, right? So they were concerned about individuals. So they thought everybody ought to be treated fairly and with dignity. Uh, the, the Stoics tried to apply to follow what are sometimes referred to as the four cardinal virtues, and those are wisdom, courage, justice, and temperance. Notice that one of them is justice. And justice for the Stoics was not, you know, when we use the word justice today, we tend to think of some kind of general theory of how things should be, right, at a societal level. The Stoics didn't think of it that way. For the Stoics, justice was an issue of personal attitude toward other people. So to treat people justly meant to treat them as human beings in the same way in which you would want to be treated, to treat other people fairly and with dignity. That's what it meant. So it was about individuals, not necessarily about society at large. The basic idea, in a sense, was that a good society emerges from the bottom up, if everybody becomes more virtuous, if everybody acts more rationally and more compassionately, then we have a better society. You cannot impose a good society from above. That's kind of tyranny, right? If you want to impose society from above, according to certain rules, that is a form of tyranny, and the Stoics were not particularly enamored with it. Okay, this is interesting, because I think in this world that we live in, like so many people identify, at least on an individual level, as activists, as people who are contributing to society and supporting people who need their help. Now, this is where you you know you have to cultivate certain ideologies. You have to have certain convictions of your own before you can speak publicly on any issue. Now, we have debates around work ethics. We have debates around how many hours we should work. There's debate around gender. There's debate around self-care. There are so many debates right now. And some of those debates, while you want to take a very compassionate approach and you want to show, like you said, like justice, um, you want to treat everyone fairly and you want to let people live life on their own terms. You know, this is where I get very confused. Where do you start exercising your own convictions? Like we see pe- journalists, we see policymakers who take a stand and say, no, this is bullshit. You all may be saying this thing where when it comes to gender politics and it comes to religious politics, they oppose those things and they oppose individual choice because according to them, allowing those individual choice will actually end up harming society in the long run and therefore it's people eventually. Yeah. This is, yeah. I... Yeah, these, those, those are complicated issues, of, yeah. of course, as you, as you know, and there isn't going to be any simple solution. No, I don't want you to give them. me any, like, I don't want to even touch these because this is, that's right. not what this conversation is about. Let's not even go there. Right. So, <laughs> to... right, but, but, I, but it's important to understand what the general stoic approach is to these, yes. to these yes. kinds of issues. So not, not the specific answer that a stoic may or may not give. So... The, the first thing that a Stoic would do is to engage in reasonable discourse with other people. So if you and I disagree on something that I, you know you think I'm wrong and I'm, or I think you're wrong about things, then Marcus Aurelius, for instance, says, teach them, explain to them, engage them into, into, with, with, in a conversation. And then he says, what happens if I, if I cannot convince that person? Well, then you just put up with it. You know, the, the, the only two choices that a Stoic really has is, or they, that a Stoic thinks are reasonable is, first of all, if you disagree with somebody, you engage in conversation. If the conversation doesn't go anywhere, if the person refuses to change their mind or to even consider a different perspective, then you just endure it. You, you say, okay, well, that's it. That's all I can do. You know, what else am I going to do? I can't, I'm not going to beat up the person. I'm not going to exercise, you know, use violence for it. So it's all about, conversation, reasonable discourse, and if the reasonable discourse doesn't work, and, you know, unfortunately, often it doesn't work, then you just disengage. Then you just say, okay, you do your thing, I'm going to do my thing. For a Stoic, the most important thing is not necessarily to ask where other people go wrong, but to ask where we go wrong, right? So is it possible 
that I actually am the one that is in the wrong here? Did I really consider the other person's opinion seriously? Or was I just waiting for that person to finish talking so that I could say my bit regardless of what he was talking about? So was I actually listening? The Stoics were uh, fundamentally Socratic. So they were inspired by Socrates. And if you read uh, a lot of the Platonic dialogues that feature Socrates, you will see that Socrates rarely gives a lecture. He, re- he rarely exposes, you know, at length a particular opinion. He usually asks questions. He says, well, do you really think that? Why, what about this? And, you know, what, what about these other things? Let, let me understand why you think this way or that way. And a lot of the Socratic dialogues and in, uh, uh, in a situation that the ancient Greeks described with the word aporia. Aporia means confusion or stalling. So, so at the end of the discussion, most Socratic discussions, nobody really has an answer. They're all kind of confused and say, oh, okay, I guess I thought I knew what I was talking about, but it turns out I don't, but I don't really have a better opinion. And according to both Socrates and the Stoics, aporia is actually the beginning of wisdom. If you realize that you may be wrong, if you realize that your convictions might not be as well substantiated as you actually thought, you're actually making progress. You're now open-minded, or at least a little bit more open-minded. So in terms of the kinds of very difficult societal issues uh, that you're talking about, I mean, the Stoic approach would simply be, okay, let's talk about it, up to the point where that talk seems to be productive. Beyond that point, you know, you keep going with your opinion and I'll keep going with my opinion. That's okay. It's, it's, it's fine to have diverging opinions. I do want to make a comment about the issue of identity, however, because as you know, uh, there's been a lot of emphasis over the last several years, especially yeah. in the United States, about all sorts of identities, right? I, ethnic, racial, gender, you, you name it. You know, na- of course, national. Uh, there's all sorts of stuff. Now, the Stoics were not particularly sympathetic toward the notion of identity. Uh, They were actually cosmopolitan. They thought there's Epictetus, one of the Stoics, the major Stoics uh, from the uh, second century, famously said, you know, when somebody asks you where you're from, don't say I'm from New York or London. Say I'm a cosmopolitan, meaning a citizen of the world. And the basic idea was like, look, of course, we all have local identities. Uh, we all have play roles. We're embedded in a particular society, etc. But at the end of the day, the Stoics thought we should remember that we're all human beings. We're all members of the the large family of humanity, and it does. It ultimately doesn't matter whether you are a man, a woman or something else, whether you are black, Hispanic, white, or something else, whether you are, you know, American or or Russian or whatever it is, we're all human beings, and we should try to act as much as possible as human beings, as members of the cosmopolis. So I think that the Stoics would not have a lot of sympathy for for our modern emphasis on, on, you know, individual roles and individual identities. It's like those tend to be more divisive than anything else. The basic idea is you are what? Great. Go ahead. Be whatever you want to be, just so long as you remember that there are other people that are different and they might act differently. Yeah, I think if we could internalize that, at least it would make space for discussions that happen without violence. And then at the end of the day, whoever is in power and whatever their ideology is, obviously the policies will be made based on that if you live in a democratic society and in under dictatorship of course that's completely like nobody's getting a say then <laughs> yeah do you think it's possible to exercise conviction with humility for in today's world do you see that happening in the discourse that you observe in the public or online do you see that that the, the, because obviously i completely understand that the people who create change have to have some very solid convictions but do you think you can do that and and make, create change and have these discourses and be a part of this like this sort of these groups the right the left political groups religious groups and do so with a lot of humility I think it is possible to exercise conviction to act with conviction and at the same time humility but it's really really difficult and I think the stoics especially the more socratically oriented of the stoics would say that Probably having too strong convictions about anything, it's not actually a good idea. 
that is because because if you if your convictions are that strong they're probably immovable you're probably not receptive to other people's arguments if you are so s strongly convinced that you are in the right um, the stoics tend to approach things with more doubt and and more uh, humility in the sense of i don't necessarily know what i'm talking about but here's my opinion here's my reasoned opinion right so you can have convictions, but those convictions, I think, ought to be kept somewhat lightly because there's always the possibility that you're wrong, or at least that you're partially wrong. You, you may not be entirely wrong, but there may be other points of view that you have not considered, you cannot consider because you have decided you marry yourself to a particular ideology, right? So, um, so you can have opinions for sure. But those opinions are to be, I think, kept, you know, that's where the humility comes from. That the humility is, uh, first and foremost, a realization that, you know what, I could be wrong about this. If somebody goes out there and, and uh, is absolutely sure that they're right, that is, I think, incompatible with the notion of humility. You cannot think that you're 100% right about anything and at the same time keep an attitude of open-mindedness and humility about about things. So I don't think that in order to, uh, to uh, achieve change, one has to be 100% convinced or very strongly convinced of something. You might, you might simply have some good ideas uh, and, and put them out there and then pursue those ideas always with the notion in the back of your mind that, you know, I, I need to be open to revise such ideas because I could be wrong. Yeah. Yeah. This is what is so shocking, especially in the past few months with the, the battles that are happening between different countries. I see people take up arms on behalf of one country and start to like perpetuate violence against innocent people who are living not even in that country, in another country. And I think that is what seems very shocking to me. And these are young people. They they have barely even experienced life. And yet their convictions are strong enough to move them to violence. They feel comfortable enough taking up weapons and throwing things and, you know, cursing out people. And it's right. it this is what this is why I think stoicism is one philosophy that guides you to a strong place in life and yet does it without making you arrogant or making you reckless with your convictions. At least that has been my learning. I think you're right. I mean, the, if, if somebody is 100% convinced that a particular position or ideology is right, then they're more likely to engage in violence in yes. order to impose that ideology on other people. Now, that said, the Stoics were not pacifists. As I said, there are examples in Stoic history of people taking up arms uh, in defense of a particular idea, but they are rare, and it's always the last resort. Right? For instance, one of my favorite examples is a guy named Cato the Younger who lived in the first century before the, the current era, and he was, an, he was an opponent of Julius Caesar. He saw Caesar as a tyrant, or at least a tyrant in the making. Now. Cato opposed Caesar for 20 years in the Senate uh, by debating him, right? So they were, they were simply having animated conversations, discussions. One was trying to pass certain laws. The other one was trying to, uh, to you know, abstract those laws and, and vice versa. So the conversation went on, the debate went on for many, many years, and Cato kept to the notion that the first thing you need to do with other people is to engage in debate, in conversation. But then at some point, Caesar famously took one of his legions and crossed the river Rubicon, which basically uh, was equivalent to declare war on the Roman Senate. That's the point when Cato said, okay, I guess discussions are, are over at this point. I need to pick up arms and, and defend my country by way of you know, engaging in combat. But it was the last resort. It was it only it came after 20 years of discussions and it only came as a response to an aggression. Right? Yeah. Only because the other side decided to pick up arms. A, a stoic would never start a fight. Yeah. They would defend themselves or they would defend their family, but they would never start a fight. They would never pick up weapons in order to start a fight. And absolutely you're absolutely right that 
way too many young people are unreflective and unthinking today and, and they just buy wholesale into a particular ideology and then they're willing to kill people or to lose their own lives yeah. as a result. Uh, these people are easily manipulated by people who 100%. then it, yeah, then exploit them. And, and they, of course, the people who exploit them never go themselves into the field and actually fight, right? They let, they let somebody else do it for them. Yeah. Yeah. It's not politically very correct to say this, but I've always believed violence to be the response of the stupid. I, I've always, yeah. I used to have anger issues. And I, when I was younger, I would end up throwing things. And this was something I had to really internalize anytime I would indulge in a response like that. I would call myself stupid over and over again. You're not capable of intelligent uh, reasoning. You're not capable of an intelligent response. And that is why you resort to violence. And I, in fact, do believe that. You're, the example you've given is amazing. And also, the what they were fighting for was such a huge Thing. It wasn't just some little thing where they were establishing their superiority. It was something that concerned all of humanity. It was right. something so important. So on an individual level, for you to believe, emotionally invest in an issue, and then to, on an individual level, start indulging in violence, start questioning someone's right to exist, it is unbelievably bizarre. I have never been able to understand where that is even coming from and what kind of arrogance would someone need to have to be able to do mm -hmm. that? It's interesting you mentioned anger. So the Stoics write a lot about anger, actually. So, and this this perhaps gives me the opportunity to talk about the emotion, how the Stoics saw emotions, because that is, as we, as we were saying earlier, that's one of the common misunderstandings that they try to suppress emotions. So the Stoics th thought that there are two broad categories of emotions. One is unhealthy. It's not good for us. And the other one is healthy. It's good for us. And the basic idea uh, that they had was that we should try to cultivate a uh, mental approach that reduces as much as possible the unhealthy emotions and cultivates as much as possible the healthy emotions. So an example of an healthy emotion, for instance, would be appropriate types of love. Love for your children is a healthy emotion. Or love for your partner is a healthy emotion or friendship is uh, the result of healthy emotions, that sort of stuff. The unhealthy emotions include obvious things like hatred, for instance, xenophobia and things like that, but also interestingly, anger. And why is it, so Seneca, for instance, who was uh, uh, a first century Stoic and was a contemporary of, roughly a contemporary of Epictetus, he wrote a whole book on, on anger. And his opinion was that anger is temporary madness. That is, when you get angry and you start you know, throwing a tantrum, and as you were saying, you also tend to become violent at, at, as a result. That's because you're basically running out of arguments. You, you don't know any longer how to argue your point, and so you, you, you become violent. You lose it, right? And um, if the definition of an unhealthy emotion, according to the Stoics, is precisely an emotion that overrides or goes against reason. When you're angry in the middle of, of an attack, of, of an anger attack, you're not thinking straight, which is why even if the anger might be motivated sometimes, you know, you, you, you received an injustice, for instance, or somebody else that you love received an injustice, that makes you angry. That's, that's understandable. That's a reasonable, you know, that's a, an understandable response, at least. If not reasonable, right. it's an understandable right. response. But the problem is that then you let that anger go on and, you know, and, and increase and you feed that anger, and you're likely to act in ways that you're then later going to regret. You're engaging in violence. You're shouting at people. You're um, you're becoming a different person temporarily. And so, and Seneca describes this as a sort of a temporary madness. You, he says, "Just look at the face of people who are angry. They look like crazy people <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> because they are crazy in in that particular moment, yeah, right? Yeah. Until they calm down, and then they become their. In fact, we still today say he's out of himself." When he's when he's angry, right? Uh, you know, or he's, he's come back to himself when the anger finally subsides. And so, uh, Seneca's uh, su suggestions for how to deal with anger are actually not very different from the ones that the American Psychological Association 
uh, lists still today on uh, on their website about anger management. He says, for one thing, as soon as you feel the anger kind of build up, you know, as soon as you feel what we now know is the rush of adrenaline, that that is the first physiological reaction, basically, uh, to anger. It's the onset of anger. He says, as soon as you you feel that, don't try to suppress it because you're going to lose. It's like, it's, it says, you know, you, there's no such thing as suppressing. You what you should do is disengage. You take that build up, that physiological build up, as an as an red alert, as a as a uh, an alert that something is happening that it's not right. So you disengage. You uh, go for a walk. You go to the bathroom. You you count until a hundred. You do whatever. You you start breathing. You know, very very calmly and deeply. Whatever it is that works, that gets you out of that particular situation. Then you just wait. Because the thing about anger is that if we don't actively uh, you know, feed it with active thinking about, yes, I, I, it's right, I need to get angry, you know, this is horrible, blah, blah. If you don't do that, it subsides on its own. It, it, doesn't, it doesn't last. It needs some kind of, of, of fuel to keep it going. If you actually disengage, Eventually, it subsides. And then Seneca says, at that point, once your anger has subsided, that is the time when you want to engage with yourself and ask yourself questions such as, why the hell was I reacting that way? What exactly was the problem? What might have been a better way, a more productive way to react so that the next time you're actually better prepared is that you recognize the situation. You said, ah, wait a minute. This, I know where this is going, and I know what I should be doing, and hopefully you're going to handle the situation better. Yeah, yeah, that is massively helpful. Thank you for sharing that, because I think this is what so many people struggle with. Um, I take, I am someone who has that firsthand experience of having no control over my anger, and I've been in physical fights with people twice my size, uh, fought with men I should not have been throwing punches at, and just it was a long time ago over 12 years ago i think but i to this day the only response i am capable of when i'm angry is walking away never ever respond respond in the moment i've yet to meet a person capable of a rational response while the anger is riding them that's right yeah you're absolutely right and in fact seneca gives a few additional suggestions which which are kind of interesting and again they they kind of uh, go with modern research in psychology. For instance, he says, never engage in an important discussion with somebody if you are tired, if you are you know, sleepy, or if you are hungry or thirsty or under any kind of physical distress. Because he realized that when we are physically distressed, our threshold for anger is lower. So you get angry, you get irritable, first of all, and then irritation leads to eventually leads to anger. So he says, if you find yourself under those situations, just say to the other person, look, I'm actually hungry now. Do you mind if I eat first? And then we can have a discussion. Or, you know, instead of having the discussion tonight, let's say with your partner, instead of having this, this discussion, this is an, you, you can acknowledge, you can say, look, this is an important point. But right now I really am tired and I know I don't do well under those conditions. So why don't we sleep over this thing? And then tomorrow morning over coffee, we're going to have that discussion, right? That sort of stuff. He also says, you know, try to surround yourself with with an environment that is not conducive to anger. He even tells you, you know, paint your, your rooms of, you know, light colors or colors that relax you, not red, go for green or blue, you know, something like that. Um, Make sure that you actually control, stay away from, if possible, if at all possible, from an environment that is noisy or that has, you know, repetitive noise kind of thing. Because those are all things that we know irritate us. And once you're irritated, then you're already primed for an angry reaction, right? So so if you've been, for instance, in an office where for the whole day there been a lot of noises and you have not been able to concentrate... You got you built irritation. Then somebody says something that annoys you, and you explode. And the person says, "What the hell is wrong with you?" Well, they don't know that you have actually been building up this thing for the whole day. You've been irritated for the whole day, but you know it, and so you can preempt it 
by trying as much as, as it is possible, of course, to change your environment or to avoid getting involved into imp in important conversations if you know that if you feel that you're not at your best, you're not, you're, you're irritated, you're angry, you're tired. Yeah, that is so true because I, when I had anger issues, my room was painted black. I used to wear black all the time. Now there is no black to be found in my environment. My wardrobe is a riot of colors. So that's, how, in fact, and it helps, right? Yes, it, <laughs> it's so massively helpful. I rarely get angry now. I just never have the energy for anger anymore. Uh, now, uh, I want to go a little bit further with this. In today's society, where me men, and their emotions are more demonized than, you know, women are allowed to have their response in like the society is changing and they've become so accommodative of women that women are allowed to be aggressive without getting judged as much. But where men are concerned, their anger gets demonized even when it's justified. They're not allowed to have what would be even a normal response. And they're very quickly called out on their, like, if they cry, then that's bad. If they get angry, that's bad. If they have any kind of normal response, that's bad. And in a world which is so quick to misunderstand men, it leaves space for people like, I don't know if you're familiar with this person, Andrew Tate. Um, yes. Someone I, um, and there are also some positive role models. Like, I think David Goggins is one of them. Again, I don't know if you're aware of uh, David Goggins, but I think he's, He's a pretty good role model to have. He's a little extreme, of course, but uh, mm. to me, he seems like, yeah, somebody to uh, take some advice from. I would love to understand the the stoic philosophy for today's men where all of their emotions are concerned from jealousy to anger. You've shared some of it, but looking at the personalities that we have in today's world, like Andrew Tate is so aggressive and so much of what he says, at least to me, does not make sense. And yet, because the world is not very supportive of men and their emotions anymore. They are very quick to adopt these role models. So talk to me a little bit about that, about the, the emotional management for these men, how they, they can exercise their masculinity without feeling demonized for it and without feeling the need to find support in role models like that. Yeah, Tate um, is is actually a, an interesting example because he, he actually does talk about stoicism, but yes. unfortunately, he doesn't seem to understand what stoicism yeah. is actually about. Yeah. Um, so so he's, a, he's an interesting example from that perspective. He's not the only one, but he's, he's, a, he's a big one. So from a stoic perspective, I guess the first thing to realize is that we really shouldn't care about other people's opinions. Uh, that much. I mean, you know, you should listen to other people because they could be telling you something that you might want to learn. But your your self esteem and your you know the way you look at yourself should not depend on other people's opinions. It should depend on your own analysis of what you're doing and whether you what you're doing is is right or not. So Epictetus, for instance, tells you you know other people's opinions is up to are up to them. You don't control them. You do not have, you know, jurisdiction over other people's opinions. So, as I said, you you might want to listen if the opinions appear to be constructive, if they're telling you something that you might learn. But other than that, your own understanding of yourself should not depend on other people's judgments, because other people's judgments are are their own. Now, they're and they're not under they're not up to you. Now, in terms of the emotions, we, we talked a little bit about how the Stoics see them. So they don't seem to be making that much of a difference, if at all, between men and women. Yes, within a particular society, men and women, of course, tend to react differently, although it's not clear at all whether that is, you know, how much that is a biological difference or, or, a, or, or a difference of upbringing or a difference of societal expectations. It doesn't really matter from a stoic perspective. The thing is, every human being, whether they're men or women or anything else, they are supposed to work on their emotions in the way that I was kind of suggesting earlier. That is, moving away from the unhealthy ones and mindfully, actively cultivating the healthy ones. And as I said, the, what distinguishes these two classes of emotions, because, you know, one could say, well, what? What counts as an unhealthy emotion? What counts as a healthy emotion? Anything that, any emotion that is aligned with reason, that is, it's a reasonable thing to do or leads you to reasonable behaviors, it's healthy. 
and any emotion that is not aligned with reason that that leads you to unhealthy behavior for yourself it's not a good emotion it's not it's not an emotion that you want to cultivate so as i said love for instance is an interesting one because they don't mean romantic love, you know, lust and things like that. In fact, they would probably think that lust is actually an unhealthy emotions, emotion because you tend to do bad things or you tend to do things that are not necessarily rational when you are in the, in the thralls of lust. But love of a sustained kind toward, as I said, friends, children, you know, uh, family, uh, pa- partners, and so on and so forth. Those are those, those kind of emotions. So if I were a man, uh, in the situation you're talking about, I would first of all pause and ask myself, what sort of emotions do I typically feel and why? Because the one of the things that it's become uh, somewhat politically incorrect these days is to question somebody's emotions. I don't, people say, oh, I just feel this way. I don't have any control because I feel this way. It's like, well, actually, you do have control over yeah. your reactions. And you should be questioning your reaction. I mean, like you did with your anger, right? I mean, it's your, you could have simply said, hey, I'm naturally an angry person. I, I just get angry. So what? But you didn't. You said, hold on. This is not good. This is not good for me, not just for other people, but it's not good for me. So I need to work on it, Right. And so if I were a man in the situation you're talking about, I would first first and foremost take some time to take an inventory of my own emotional reactions. You know, what is it that how do I react to certain situations and why? Now the Stoics do think that there are some tools that we can use in order to engage in that kind of self-analysis. And some of these tools are actually the efficacy of some of these tools is actually confirmed by modern cognitive behavioral therapy. One major tool is journaling. So one of ma- one basic stoic technique, which I do pretty much every day, is to open up a journal and start writing down certain things. But but the there is there are, there are ways to do it and there are ways not to do it. So a lot of people when they journal, they just write everything or you know all sorts of stuff that happened to them. You know, oh, today I went up and I did this and that. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about focusing on on your emotional responses and on your ethical or unethical behaviors. You know, that kind the kind of stuff that it's really important in your life. Number one. Number two, you don't write in the first person. You don't say I did this or did or did that. As much as that comes natural. The Stoics suggest that you write in the second person, like Marcus Aurelius does in the meditations. He says, you did this, you did that. There is very good evidence from modern cognitive science that writing in the second person actually helps you because it puts some emotional distance between you and your own responses and actions. Basically, think of it this way. It's like you were writing to a friend. Right? If you write to a friend, you say, hey, you did this, then you tend to be more charitable, first of all, and also more compassionate because it's your friend that you're writing about to, and also trying to be more constructive. You can say, you know, I noticed that you did this, but what about doing that instead or that sort of thing? Except that it's that you are your own friend in this case. So you're writing to yourself in the second person. And the, la- the other thing that they do, the last thing that they suggest, that the Stoics suggest to do when you journal is to use as analytic a language as possible and try to stay away from emotional language. Because the, the notion is that, that the reason you're doing this, you're doing the journaling, is not to relive your experience. You don't want to get angry. If, if, for instance, you got angry to, with a co-worker, you don't want to relive your anger. That's not, that's not healthy. That's not a good thing. Uh, what you want to do is to analyze yourself. You want to say, why did I get angry? What triggered it? And you want to ask yourself, if something like this is going to happen again, if a similar situation happens again, what would be a better way to handle it. How should I behave the next time that this comes about? And so you want to, again, you, you, you're kind of writing as if you were your own therapist, essentially, and, and say, you know, you really think this is a good thing? You know, wh- why did you do this? That sort of stuff. So journaling is a major way of improving your relationship with your own emotions. However, we also know that 
unfortunately, human beings are very good at rationalizing. So we're, we're very good at, at yeah. coming up with excuses for why we did certain things or, and, and not other things, that sort of stuff. So if you only journal, there is a danger that you're going to rationalize your own behaviors even within your journal. In other words, that you're not really honest with yourself. Even though nobody else is going to read that journal, you're not necessarily going to be honest. That is why, and, and here I'm going back to your question about, you know, men and how, and how to behave. Uh, the Stoics thought that a very important aspect of our life is to find and then cultivate close friendships. You don't need a lot of friends, according to the Stoics. In fact, one it may be enough, or certainly a small number, because good friendship really is, first of all, it's rare, and second of all, it requires a lot of energy and time to cultivate. You don't, you know, if, if it's a good thing, you don't just see them once every six months. You see them on a regular basis, you, you, you build rapport with that person. Why a good friend? Because a good friend in, for a Stoic is somebody who is not afraid, if, you, if need be, to look in your eyes and say, you know, that was pretty shitty. Or, you know, this is not the kind of thing that, you know, I wonder, why did you do that? That kind of thing. So you have to find somebody who has the guts to at least occasionally, when it's necessary, to basically call your own bullshit and say, no, I don't think so. I think you're actually rationalizing about this thing. I think that there is a better way to do it. That's the second way. The third and last uh, sort of suge practical suggestions that the Stoics make is to uh, choose one or more role models. So think of somebody you admire, and this may be somebody you know or somebody you've heard of, or you've read about. It could be even a fictional uh, character. But somebody you admire and you ask yourself, what would that person do? Right? Or what would that person done under these kind of conditions, situations? Again, there is pretty good evidence from cognitive behavioral therapy that using a role model and keeping a role model in your mind when you make decisions and when you act actually does help. People, people tend to act better, more reasonably, more ethically when they have a role model. In my case, for instance, I often use my grandfather that I grew up with as a role model because he was a decent person. He was, he was, you know, he was just the kind of, I never saw him angry. He was always kind with other people. He was always trying to be helpful with other people. He never gave lectures to other people. He just acted in a decent way, right? And so I, I often find myself asking, you know, so what would grandfather say about this? Or how would he act? That doesn't mean you necessarily are going always to act as the role model would. But the very fact that you're pausing and asking yourself that question is actually helpful because one of the major issues with human behavior is that often we we react instead of acting that is that is right so something happens there's a stimulus that ha that comes our way and we react without thinking about it instead if we take our time to sort of slow down kind of sort of the opposite of the famous commercial instead of just do it you know pause and and then think about it and decide if you really need to do it and yeah. and most of the you know socket is used to say that he had a, a daemon on his shoulder. Daemon was a Greek word that eventually gave, the, uh, gave us the English word demon. But for the Greeks, demons were not necessarily you know, nasty, negative uh, entities. They might have been positive, helpful ones. And Socrates uh, kept saying that he goes around with his daemon on his shoulder, and his daemon would whisper in his ear. And most of the times, you know, at some point, one of Socrates friends asks him he says you know so what does the demon say typically and socrates response was usually he says don't like don't do it <laughs> so it, it slows me down it, it yeah. makes me think that you know do you really want to do this thing is is that really the right thing to do maybe you should just wait and see what happens yeah these are all so amazing i i wish i had the discipline to do them every day but i do some of it and at least as as much as frequently as I can, and they have really 
had a life changing effect uh, for me and and on other people that I've met in support groups. In fact, there's something else that I've learned from you from your book. You would in your book you would describe how you would go on walks and you would be talking to a Stoic philosopher and they would be giving you advice and you would have these conversations. I am very fascinated by Ayn Rand. So sometimes when I was, you know, coming out of depression, I did a lot of journaling during that period because so much of it was figuring out how my mind works, why it works the way it does. And I would have those conversations in my journal. This was something I learned from you and it was just so massively helpful. But I have to ask because and today's in today's world, role models, like, you know, Andrew Tate's example is he has a massive following. He says so much bizarre shit and, and yet for some reason yeah. he has a massive following and I kind of understand it because he's someone who is telling men that it's okay to be men in the conventional sense of the word. Uh, right. But at the same time, I don't think he's a great role model. So No, I would any, agree. It's, he's not. <laughs> no. <laughs> any, any role models from, uh, like you would recommend that people can read about. Like for me, I think it was Marcus Aurelius is somebody amazing for men, I specifically for men. And also any caution you would give to people as they are, you know, emu trying to emulate that role model perhaps. Yeah, that's a good question. So you need to be very careful about the, cho the choice of a role model. And, and, and it usually it's a bad idea to go with sort of popular role models or popular yes, people yes. because by and large uh, it's a good bet that if somebody's popular it's for the wrong reasons and sure. and you know Tate is a very good example uh, of that um i would say certainly among among so the ancients marcus aurelius is a good it's a good model my personal one is epictetus because he was quite a character he had an interesting sense of humor he was a non nonsense kind of thought if you read the discourses by epictetus you know sometimes i laugh out loud when i read certain portions because it's like you know the guy is i would i wish i i couldn't uh, met him because he's he's he sounds like a lot of, of fun to interact with um, however, role models that are alive today or recently alive are probably better. So I, that's why I go for people that I know and, and respect, such as my grandfather, or people that I respect even though I don't know them. Like, I don't know, for instance, Nelson Mandela is a good example. Yes. Uh, he was, um, you know, we all know the, 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 the broad story about Mandela, but not a, not not many people know that one of the turning points in Mandela's life was when he was in prison in South Africa and somebody smuggled in a copy of Marcus Aurelius's Meditations. And uh, Mandela read it and he was very angry at the time and understandably so. He, you know, he, he and his people were being oppressed and, yeah. you know, he was in jail, occasionally tortured, you know, that's so you good reasons to get angry, to yeah. be to be upset about things, right? But Mandela read Marcus Aurelius, who keeps saying in the meditations, you know, be kind to yourself and to other people. Remember that the other person, as much as he may seem, you know, bad and evil to you, really is another human being. He has friends and family and children and so on and so forth, just as you do. And he's just misguided. He's, he's just acting in ways that are not right. But he doesn't want to act in ways that are not right. He just thinks he's right. So he's misguided. Um, so that kind of compassion really hit uh, home with Mandela. And, and he made the decision to, to change or be a drop the anger as much as possible and actually reach out. And he became famous for doing exactly that for, for the rest of his life. He became famous as an incredibly calm person under difficult circumstances and one who would constantly reach out to the other side. And it worked, uh, you know, by and large. It doesn't, you know, it's not a panacea. It's not, you know, you don't do miracles like that, but it works. So Marcus Aurelius is, is actually a, a good example, uh, but so is Nelson Mandela. As if you're looking at for a man role, you know, a, yeah. a male role model. Those are those are two of my favorite. Yeah, that's, that's helpful. I have to ask you here, um, in, a lot of people who are fascinated by stoicism will question about the practical application of stoicism in today's world with and and I'm trying to like get this question right because this is something that really I struggle with 
anytime we would be talking about a person, a second person, I would be talking to a friend or a collaborator. And we, very often we, somebody would say something like, but he's, he's an okay person or she's an okay person because, you know, looking at the, the way the world is, they're fine. And I'm like, the standards have fallen so much into for behavior today that if someone is not raping or murdering or stealing, they are considered, they're fine. They're a fine citizen of society. I, I find that very strange. So I often struggle with the with this modern definition of morality, with the way people adapt morality to their own needs. How do you think Stoics would handle being a part of this society where the moral values are, have declined so much? Um, they are people are ambitious, and I understand that. But to adapt morality to accommodate your ambitions is, is bizarre to me. How do you think, like, this is something I, I know a lot of people struggle with. This is where they feel like Stoics are not very helpful because how are we supposed to live with those principles and also exist in a successful way in this society? Well, that's a great question. But first of all, uh, the Stoics would say, why is it so important to be successful in the first place? That's an external standard of judgment. And so it's a, somebody else's judgment. Why, why, would, why should you follow another person's or society's standard of judgment? What is so important about being successful? But another answer I think that the Stoics have is in the concept of virtue. Uh, you know, the, the goal of, the, of a Stoic is to act virtuously. And virtue is a kind of a weird word these days. It sounds yeah. very old-fashioned and it's like, <laughs> and, and it sounds very Christian. You know, you, you think, oh, you've, what does that mean? That I should be chaste and pure, you know, things like that. No, the word virtue actually comes from the Greek arete. It's a translation of the Greek arete. And arete just means excellence. So what the Stoics are saying is that you want to be, the, you, you, what you want to try to be is the best human being you can be. So none of this mediocrity kind of stuff that you're talking about, right? Good enough isn't good enough for the Stoics. You want to be the best that you can be. Yeah. Uh, and if you say to yourself, well, that's good enough. I'm, you know, I'm not murdering anybody. I'm not raping anybody. So that's good enough. The Stoics would say, no, it isn't. This is not the best version of you. This is not the most excellent version of you. So why are you stopping there? Yeah, it's certainly good that you're not murdering or raping anybody, but that's pretty the bar very low. In fact, Epictetus at one point has um, a conversation with one of his students, and the student says, you know, but if I if I were to do this, uh, then then I, there are consequences. You know, I, I might suffer negative consequences. And uh, Epictetus' response is, well, you should set the bar as high as possible. At some point, of course, you're gonna. There's a limit to all. All of us have limits, but make sure you put the bar as high as possible. Don't sell your integrity cheap, essentially. And I think that the problem you're talking about is that too many of us these days uh, have been taught to 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 sell our integrity cheaply. Yes. We don't. We don't. We think, oh well, why why bother? Or or I can't get there. It's like yes, you can. You, you can you can do better. You know, ask ask yourself honestly. You know, could I've done better today? Uh, and the answer is probably going to be yes. <laughs> uh, and so try to do that tomorrow, right? So the in in to some extent, one of the things that I like about stoicism is that it's this really interesting combination of being very uh, self forgiving, right? So stoics are not into beating themselves. Uh, because oh my gosh, I did something wrong, and therefore now I'm a horrible human. That's none of that. If you do something wrong, you stop, you pause, you learn from the experience, and then you say, "I'm going to do better the next time." Beating yourself up doesn't do anything. So it's it's a very self-forgiving philosophy. But at the same time, it's also a philosophy that keeps pushing the bar higher and higher because the goal is excellence. Yes. The goal is to be the best human being you can be, and. Most of us are short of that goal, so so there is room for improvement. So there is, uh, you know, th so this notion that oh well, I'm good enough, it's just not, it's not acceptable in stoicism. You you really need to do better, and you can do better because we can we can always do better. The analogy, one of the analogies that uh, the Stoics make is with athletics. So if you go to the gym, for instance, right, um, your goal isn't necessarily going to be to, you know participate into the, to the Olympics. You're not, you're not a professional athlete, but your goal definitely should be to improve, to get better, right? If you take, if you um, 
go to the gym and, and you hire a trainer, trainer, for instance, the trainer will never tell you to stop at the level where you are. If you can lift 50 pounds, the trainer will put 55 on it. If you can run for 20 minutes, the, the trainer would say, okay, try 25 the next time. Right? If you can uh, climb uh, with a four degree incline, the next time the trainer is going to say, well, why don't you try 4.5? The goal is not to, again, become a professional athlete. The goal, the goal is to do better than you were doing. If you don't try to do better, then you're guaranteed never to do better. Right? And so it's, it's very similar in terms of our behavior. It, we should never accept the notion that, oh, well, what I'm doing is good enough because it's probably not. I, I set high standards for myself and I fail pretty much every day. <laughs> but it's better sure. to fail with re bar set really freaking high than have it right. down here and then, you know, become like a mediocre person and not even realize it. Exactly. I mean, putting the push in the bar higher and higher does mean that you're probably going to fail most of the times but you're also improving yes and that's the goal right the goal is not perfection the goal is to improve improve to do better yeah um i am very curious um to get your take on this if social media you know existed at Marcus Aurelius's time. And, and I keep saying Marcus Aurelius because that's the one I'm most familiar with. But really, the Stoics were here right now. And if they had to exist with social media as such a dominant part of society, how do you think they would handle that? Like, what perspective would they maintain as they use social media, perhaps for professional reasons or whatever? Well, uh, I can give you my own example. I quit social media some time ago and I said, you know what, enough is enough. Uh, it's not that I'm against, you know, anti-technology. On the contrary, I tend to be actually an early adopter of technology. I was on Twitter shortly after it came out, and I was on Facebook shortly after it came out. But the problem is, and, and, and also I do recognize that uh, social media at least have the potential to be very useful, right? There's all sorts of good things about it. You could, in fact, you find you find out about things that you might never been exposed to. You keep you can keep in touch with friends or colleagues. It's there's all sorts of good stuff. Unfortunately, the way things have gone, especially in recent years, many social, if not all, social media companies, there are not that many of them anyway, have engineered on purpose things that maximize, of course, their profits. Their private companies so of course they do that right but unfortunately that maximization of profit has meant a serious decline in the quality of discourse online um one of the and this is document this is not just an opinion out of you know many this has actually been documented by social scientists that been there's been research on this thing right one of the major Turning points, for instance, was Facebook's invention of the angry button. We were talking about anger earlier. Uh, turns out that Facebook engineers, software engineers, at some point, they realized that if they put an angry button available among the options, people hit that button many, many more times than they hit any other, anything else. So they're driven to, therefore, the kind of posts that make them angry, right? Yeah. And once that the social media platform knows that, they can engineer the algorithm to maximize the number of posts. You're, you're exposed more and more to that kind of post that generate angry responses. Why? Because that, of course, drives advertisements and therefore drives profits. So this was engineered that way. This was on purpose. Um, and it's not good. Uh, so as a result, I decided that, you know what, I'm just not doing enough good here and I'm getting a lot of negative uh not only negative reactions from other people but also it's just not good for me therefore i i quit uh the only pseudo social media that i use is is substack but that's a newsletter platform it's a very different kind of structure now that said you could also use social media in a stoic fashion as a essentially one way to train yourself because when I was on Twitter, for instance, I would say to myself the same thing that Marcus Aurelius says himself to himself in the meditations at some point. He says, remember, today you will encounter a bunch of nasty people who don't know better and you're gonna, they're going to try to make you angry. Just don't let them. Right? So it becomes an exercise in, in stoic mindfulness. You, and also it becomes an exercise in stoic temperance. One of the four cardinal virtues that I mentioned earlier is temperance, right? So if you can be that, that mindful and that, that careful 
only to respond to you know constructive comments never to engage with trolls never to you know never to respond in an angry fashion etc cetera, etc cetera. that's actually probably a good exercise for you it's actually yeah. a good use of social media it's it's a kind of a training ground uh, for managing your emotions and for trying to be as constructive as possible but i think it's hard um, as i said it's, it's hard enough that i decided not to do it i decided that i i have better better ways to spend my time there is a, a letter that is written by by seneca to his friend lucilius where he does something similar of course there were no social media at the time but uh, seneca complains at the beginning of the letter about all the noise he's in rome and and he complains about all the noise from the street uh that that's drifting up to his apartment and and you know he he finds it difficult to concentrate he cannot write he cannot read you know that sort of stuff. and initially he says to lucilius to his friend lucilius he says you know so i'm i decided to use that as an exercise in stoic temperance i'm gonna i'm gonna just stay with it and i'm gonna you know, be be good about it. I'm going to be temperate about it. I'm not going to get angry, et cetera, et cetera. Great. And then by the end of the letter, he says, oh, by the way, I moved because it was too much. <laughs> I just couldn't, you know, I couldn't work. So at some point I decided that it was actually better to move. I think I did the same thing with social media. Uh, initially, my response was, okay, I can use this as a training ground and, you know, to try to uh, become more temperate and less angry, etc. And then at some point, after doing that for a year or two, I thought, nah, you know what? I think it's actually better off if I completely quit it and, and do something else. I mean, we are we got into this, you know, we bought at this point into this notion that certain things are a must. Otherwise, you're not a member of society, right? You have to be on social media. Why? We, we live perfectly well without social media and up until a few years ago. There's no need for it. There's no no necessity of it. Uh, even at a professional level, you know, people often say, oh, but profession. I don't know. I have I thought so when I was on Twitter and Facebook. But now that I quit, my profession doesn't seem to have suffered at all. In fact, I'm doing better because I have more time and more calm to dedicate to what I actually need to do, which is doing, you know, prepare for my teaching and writing my papers and books and stuff like that, uh, it actually has improved, not to mention, of course, improving my just sort of well-being and, and, and tranquility of mind. Yeah, it's, it's surprising to me, but I think social media is, people talk about how stoicism does not have practical applications in today's world. And I would say <laughs> social media is like the biggest example of mm -hmm. why these principles are more valid today per, than perhaps they were back when they were formulated, back when they were pushed as these guiding principles for life. And I think like social media, so far as patience and temperance and in your emotional response is concerned, I think social media tells you why it's so, so important. All of this, like we have now invented a term because it's it happens so often, the keyboard warriors who are dedicating their life to perpetuating nonsense. I mean, I've never heard that term be used for a good reason to describe someone <laughs> doing good in the world. It's always some troll who is, I don't know, is, doesn't have anything better to do and is now trashing people. I think this is this is where those principles are so valid. Temperance, you see something obnoxious, you move on, you don't respond. Yeah. yeah. I don't understand um, the, you know, somebody who says that stoicism doesn't have practical application, they really must not know much about stoicism yeah. in the first place, because it seems to me that it's actually rife with applications for for today's life. It's also kind of funny because I wonder if anybody would say, you know, Buddhism doesn't have any application to the contemporary world or something like that. It, that seems like a strange thing to say, because it very clearly does have a lot of applications. And, and the main reason it has these philosophies uh, that were thought uh, and articulated, thought about and articulated, you know, two or two and a half millennia ago. The reason they still have application is because human beings have not changed that much. Yes, our technology and science certainly have changed, right? I mean, let's say if Marcus Aurelius were to all of a sudden join our conversation, right? He would be initially stunned by the technology. He would say, "Wow, I'm looking into this thing, and and somehow I'm able to talk to somebody, you know, thousands of miles away in real time." And so he would be absolutely astounded. But then he will settle down, 
and he will be starting listening to what we're actually talking about. And all of that will be familiar. Yes. You, you would say, oh, they're talking about anger. They're talking about people being obnoxious. They're talking about, you know, uh, values. They're talking about doing the right thing. So they're basically talking about the same kind of stuff that we were talking about 2,000 years ago. That That's why Stoicism, Buddhism, and frankly, even Christianity or other religions, that's why they're relevant today. Because human beings, by and large, have not changed. We still want the same things, go after the same things, and are afraid of the same things. Um, so, yeah, it's it's a really weird thing to say that, that, that these ideas are not relevant. I think I have one explanation for it, is the fact that we have normalized impulsivity in this world. Emotional reactivity is so normalized, especially, I think, in America. People are just, I, I saw this viral YouTube video. I'm someone who has sensory sensitivity uh, it's connected to my anxiety, but I, I can manage it. I never need other people to be accommodative of my sensitivity. But I saw this person in a conference of many thousands of people in that room walk up to the front of the room and ask people that they speak quietly in a lower volume because he has sensory sensitivity. That was shocking to me that you would expect thousands and thousands of people to be accommodative of you and your I, I don't know what term to use here, your your needs, and to have them be prioritized. Are, are you really that arrogant? Are you really that self-indulgent in general in your life that you would think that that is a possibility, that you can ask thousands of people who are there for a purpose to subvert their own needs that are supposed to be prioritized to accommodate you? As but opposed I, to doing something yourself, like putting some yes. plugs in your ears, for instance, yes. <laughs> or whatever, whatever works. Right. Yeah, we do live in a society where we, we've been encouraged to be entitled about all sorts of things. And, and look, it's, it, it is a compromise. I mean, as a society, we certainly do have a, a duty toward other people who may be disadvantaged one way or the other to accommodate them, but within limits, as you were saying. You know, there are certain things. I mean, any accommodation causes problems for somebody else. You know, to accommodate somebody will usually cause issues for somebody else. It will cost money. Uh, it would cost an efforts that and that are limited. And therefore, you know, if you ask for an accommodation that is very expensive, that means somebody else is not going to get something else as a result of the fact that that money is going to be used. So it's it should be a open discussion within society about, you know, where do we draw the lines? And that line might be fluid. In some cases, we draw it a little bit closer over here. In other places, we do it over there. But this notion of entitlement is, in fact, and uh, problematic, increasingly problematic. And as I said, there is also this emotional entitlement. You know, you're not allowed to question my reactions because they're mine and who are you uh, to question? Well, I mean, you know, we're, we're human beings. Uh, we're members of a society. Perhaps you might learn something from, from somebody questioning a particular reaction or asking you, you know, why, why is it that you're reacting this way? Perhaps you could do it differently, right? It's, it is another form of entitlement. It's another form of isolation. We live in a society. We don't live, we're not individuals that are completely isolated. We cannot do whatever the heck we want because by definition, we are in a group. And so it's, you know, living in a group, it's a matter of give and take. And you can't just take, you have to give at least at least from time to time. Yeah, the safe spaces seem to be on the rise. And on the surface of it, it seems like such a wonderful idea and so considerate of everyone. And yet, if you think about it, safe spaces, you're basically telling people, oh, no need to learn to manage your emotions, no need to become an effective adult. By all means, use these safe spaces to be emotionally indulgent. And mm -hmm. instead of learning to exist in society with all of your emotions, it's just, yeah, we, we just live in a bizarre world. That's we are, why we are surrounded by adult babies. I mean, the whole notion of a safe space, again, it's sometimes it does have an application. For instance, I don't know, uh, shelters for battered women of are course, typically, course, you know, yeah. blocked. You know, they, they pre typically don't allow men to come in, you know, that sort of stuff. Yes. Those are physically self Physical, uh, uh, yes. safe spaces. But the whole notion of an emotionally or intellectual self-space, it's a little bit problematic because, first of all, the world doesn't work that way. So you may be 
you know, in a, you may have access to a safe space on a university campus, but as soon as you go out into the, the real world and you have a job, you know, that safe space is going to be gone. And arguably, the fact that you are used to a safe space actually undermines your ability to function in society at large, because then you expect those spaces, that kind of protection from everywhere. Uh, but also, you, you know, Again, sometimes there are people who have very specific situations, either pathological situations or very extreme situations that do need for, you know, that they need help and shelter of a particular kind. They need therapy, for instance, or they, you know, or, or any other kind of support. But broadly speaking, if you are a normally functional human being and you're telling me that you cannot take somebody else's opinion because it hurts you or it hurts your feelings, well, uh, grow up. Uh, it's the only <laughs> response that I can possibly articulate, yeah. right? It's like, well, if somebody, it's another person's opinion, uh, even if you don't like it, why would it have to hurt you, right? Uh, now, here, Epictetus is definitely going to be politically incorrect. Uh, in the Enchiridion, in the, in the, in the manual, uh, he says, it is not other, it is not things that upset us, but only our opinion about things. So, so translated to what we're talking about is like it's not what the other person is saying that is that is actually hurting you, is your own opinion of what that person is saying. Uh, the typical example for for uh, Stoics is insults. Right. So Epictetus says the way we should respond to insults is like a rock. He actually tells, sorry, in other words, no response at all. Uh, he says to one of his students, like, try to pick up a rock and start insulting it. How is that going to go, right? Well, you're just going to get frustrated because the rock is not responding, right? Uh, it's, the rock is completely ignoring you. And that is the way to deal with insults. It's like, oh, but it, 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 it's, it's awful that he's insulting me. Why is it awful? An insult is simply somebody opening their mouths and, and, and articulating something, Um why should that be any do anything to you at all? Uh, another way, uh, another time, Epictetus also talks about insults, and he says, "Look, there is only two possibilities here. If somebody insults is insulting you, and let's say they're saying, oh, you know, you did a horrible thing there. What the hell is wrong with you?' Okay. Well, there are only two possibilities. Either they're right, right? They, they may be articulating it in an improper fashion, but they're right fundamentally. In which case." Forget the insult, learn, right? If they're right, then the proper response is, oh, okay, you could have said it better, yeah. but I get it. You know, there is an issue. I need to work on something. Or they're wrong. And, and if they're wrong, then why is that anything to you? It's their problem. Um, he, he says, you know, something along the lines of, you know, if, um, if somebody doesn't understand the mathematical equation, that the problem is not with the equation, it's with them. If, if they if they articulate a bad piece of logic, the problem is not with the piece of logic. The problem is with them. These these people are just mistaken. And why would uh, would you be upset or offended about somebody being mistaken? It's like, so what? It doesn't matter what their intentions is either, because your intention again is not up to you. It's up to them. Okay, fine. They're trying to try to you know, they're trying to rail you up. They're trying to get you upset. But it's up to you not to let them. It's up to you to just walk. Just say, okay, see ya. And if you do that, they're really going to be upset because the whole point of an insult is to get a response. Yes. If you don't respond, if you just walk away, the other person is just left like an idiot. <laughs> it's like, oh, I guess it didn't work, right? Yeah. So I think that we could all learn from that kind of treatment of, of things that might hurt us. You know, it's, if, if something hurt us, if an opinion or a, or a notion hurt us, that is because we think in a certain way. It doesn't matter what the other person wanted to say or whether they're right or they're wrong. It's just, it's up to us. Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot of power in that approach. And I think this is power that we all need. So <laughs> thank you for that. I have one more question uh, that uh, comes up a lot. Um, this is something I asked for questions that people had that they would like for me to ask you. And this was this was asked most frequently that love and comes to love. People try. They have had many partners. It doesn't work out. They are and they are left alone. 
And after a certain point, you start to wonder if it's you. Am I the problem? If you are disappointed in love over and over again, at some point you have to wonder, am I the problem? And the answer might be, yeah, <laughs> you might be the problem. Uh, and so, um, or not. I mean, it depends, right? It's, it's, it's really complicated. Human relationships are complicated. Sure. Yeah. Uh, societal expectations often get in the way. For instance, I was reading an article just the other day about you know relationships that do or do not last and one of the problems the author of the article was pointing out is that increasingly in our society we put a lot of uh of expectations on our relationships we want the other person our partner to be our best friend and also a, a good sexual partner and also a somebody who helps us in daily life and also somebody who is there emotionally it's like that's a lot to ask for yeah. one person right and wh why don't you distribute these things a little bit around so you know if you need an intellectual companion go out with a friend or with a colleague uh you know if you need uh somebody who to to confide in again go out for, with a with a friend or go to a therapist or something like that. Don't ask one person to do all of those things simultaneously in your life because you know that's that's asking too much. Are you doing the same kind of things? You're you're probably not up to that jump. So part of the problem here, I think, is societal expectations. Uh, but certainly sometimes the problem is us. And the Stoic would say, right, so journal, go back to your journal. Uh, Start seeing, you know, ask yourself, are there patterns here? Is this something that is happening over and over? You know, why, what is it that went wrong with my previous relationships? And if you cannot do it by, your, by yourself or if you don't trust yourself, again, same thing. Ask a friend, uh, invoke a role model, or in fact, go to a therapist. You know, uh, I would recommend the cognitive behavioral therapist because CBT, or cognitive behavioral therapy, actually is based on stoicism. It started out in the 1950s inspired by uh, stoic principles so seek some help right so some clarity do question yourself because yeah if you i mean I, albert einstein famously said that um, the the hallmark of madness is to try to do the same thing over and over and expect a different outcome right so if you tried three four five six seven relationships and they all didn't go well and they and looks like it's the same pattern then perhaps you are the problem Perhaps you can work on it. You know, perhaps you just, you just need to start lower instead of going out with a human being. The next time, get a dog, uh, and and start you know start a little simpler, a little easier. Ask yourself at least question yourself. At least have the courage. As I said, one of the four cardinal virtues is courage. Have the courage to question yourself. Have the courage to say, look at yourself in the mirror, and say, you know, maybe. Maybe I am part of the problem. Maybe I'm not the, the whole problem, but perhaps I am part of the problem. So let's work on it. Instead of beating yourself up, because again, beating yourself up is not useful. But instead of doing that, so think of it rationally and say, what was going on here? Is there any pattern? Can I identify anything, anything that is happening over and over? And if I do, once I do, can I do something about it? What kind of help do I need in order to do to do something but but also as i said lower your expectations in that case about other people in increase your expectations about yourself but lower the expectations for other people don't put that much burden on on one person because that's uh that's too much it's not sustainable you know people are not are not going to be able to sustain it for a long time so we've reached the end of this video. Thank you so much for watching and for sharing your time with me. The video description will have the link to all the resources mentioned during the conversation. And if you would rather listen to these episodes, then you can find Experimental Podcast on most podcast platforms. If you enjoyed the video, please do share your thoughts in the comment section. And if you want to watch more, subscribe to the channel, please, and do hit the notification bell. I will see you again in the next video. Till then, please do take care of yourself. Bye.